is Rebecca Schissel Marshall with Whole Body Upgrade, a podcast to help you get unstuck, feel better, and have more energy. Let's get started. Welcome to episode 63, the Whole Body Upgrade podcast. I want to begin by welcoming in the great directions. I welcome in the direction of the east, the south, the west, and the north the direction that is above and below, and the direction that is within. I welcome in all of the elements that support us each day. Air, fire, water, and earth. I welcome in the loving and helping compassionate spirits that are of the light, and the ancestors who have lived well and died well. And I acknowledge that we are on the land of the creek in the Cherokee in what is now known as Athens, Georgia. Hello. Hello, my sweet friends. How are you? How are you navigating this 3D world (laughs) that we're living in? Last week, I had all of these incredible aha moments. The aha moments showed up with Just this gentle unfolding. One aha and then another that led to another. It was just like this cascade of beautiful events that I watched. This cascade of breakthroughs that happened. And I saw again, as I always do, this connection of emotions and thoughts and physical experiences and behaviors and how they're all interacting along with energy and spirit. And it was like a veil had been lifted for me. And I finally saw (laughs) this kind of like underneath all of these pieces, I finally saw this belief that was driving it all. And for me, it was very freeing to see that. So that's not exactly (laughs) what, (laughs) what this week is about, but it is relevant. Because so often it feels like I've been sitting in the same place for so long and it feels like nothing is going to change. It feels like it's going to be like this forever. And then it changes. Usually right as I'm about to give up, things change. Something drops in, a piece of wisdom, something I should do next, an action I should take. And that the action or or the piece of wisdom may lead to that unfolding, right? And this has been true, especially when I'm looking at emotional or physical health. I sit with something, I get to the point of I can't take it anymore, <laughs> and then it changes. And I see this so often when my clients want to change what they eat and they want to see changes right away. Some of my clients want to lose weight. Some of them want to have more energy right away. And sometimes it, it just takes time for the body to react to the changes in either what's being eaten or new supplements or new patterns. Here's what I typically see happen. There's something new that needs to be incorporated into daily life, exercising more or sleeping more or changing food patterns or what you're eating, whatever nutritional sustenance you're taking in. It's new and it's different. So there's an emotional reaction as well, right? There's something emotional that then gets triggered as well as the thoughts that come up about this change. Usually the thoughts can be like, this is too hard. I can't do this. <laughs> a lot of my clients are like, but I just love bread. I love cheese, right? And that, you know, that's the thought that they're having. But I, how will I live without bread? How will I live without cheese? So the brain is resisting because change is happening. And the brain doesn't like change right? So the brain doesn't want this change to happen. And if you have some sort of an emotional arising that happens at the same time, if there's an emotion that's, that's around the food as well, that's going to be up too. 
So the brain is resisting because the brain doesn't like change, right? It wants to stay the same. So the resistance is there, which we spoke about on a previous episode, right? So the brain is saying, no, I don't want to change. So it's looking for every reason to stop this new routine because the new routine takes more of its energy, takes more brain power, it takes more attention, right, um, than an old routine of what you were doing before. So what we know about the brain, what we know about the way that the brain functions and what we know about neural retraining and brain retraining called neuroplasticity is that if we want to see change, if we want to see change, uh, and this is very specific if we're talking about motor learning, right? So I'm teaching at the university. I'm teaching about brain rehab for people post-stroke, right? That's one of the things, one of my areas that I teach about. And what we know is it takes thousands of trials, thousands of trials to make new connections in the brain and make it feel effortless, right? So that's massed practice. It's called mass practice and it's a lot, right? Thousands of trials. Now, can you make change with only a few trials? Yes. And by trials, I mean practice sessions. <laughs> so going to sit down on your meditation cushion um, maybe won't take thousands of times for you to do it, but that habit, that pattern of what you do in meditation, which is go away, right? You're off and then you come back. You go away and then you come back. That's thousands of trials every day, right? To train your brain. So those changes or the lack of changes, the new things feel hard in the brain because in you haven't mastered it yet. You don't have those neural pathways. When the neural pathways are there, things move much more quickly and they feel easier because they've been strengthened by being um, paired together over and over and over again. So you, the more you practice it, the more that you do that thing that you want to do, even though it feels hard, the better at it you get and the easier it starts to feel. Now, a second principle of neuroplasticity is that the new neuronal connections happen more quickly if the training is intensive. So what do I mean by that? If you want to pick up a new habit, if you're doing it once a week, it's less likely, right? That's not intense. Intensity is doing it all the time, right? Practicing daily or multiple times a day if you can. So what it means is that the if you're doing it all together at once, it's going to be more helpful to make that change than spreading it out a little bit of a time. So intensive training is where you, you make sure that it's an intense amount of practice in a short amount of time. Language immersion is a great example of this. When you are wanting to change something new and have new pathways and new connections, if you make whatever it is you're practicing the focus, right, that you do it a lot, thousands of trials in a short period of time. So you practice, maybe you start practicing meditation at morning, at noon, and at dinner, right? Or at night before you go to bed, you practice in an intense amount and you're getting thousands of trials. You wouldn't just practice once a week. So there you are, right? Trying to make a change and the brain is resisting. The brain is saying, no, I'm not going to because this feels hard because it's new, because those pathways haven't been made strong yet, right? It's like walking on a hiking path um, when there are lots of leaves down, it's hard to see. It makes it a little bit harder. But when a lot of people have gone over it lots of times, you can see the pathway very clearly. So when the brain is saying no and it's resisting, the brain gets tired. The brain gets tired because it's having to make lots of new choices and new decisions. So it can't just grab the cupcake that it would normally grab on the countertop, or it can't just grab the Danish that's in the work break room, right? This is a lot of choices of like, wait, can I have that? Should I not have that? 
uh, is now a good time to have that? Is, did I have a cheat day? Right? Those are all those decisions. When the brain gets tired, right? You've probably heard of decision fatigue because it's constantly trying to do new things. And of course, the food system in our country is not set up to encourage you to eat things that are healthy. It's set up with horrible choices at every corner, the vending machine with candy bars and sodas, and the, even restaurants. They don't always have a lot of healthy options that are anti-inflammatory, that have are mostly plant-based, that aren't fried, right, that don't have hydrogenated oils. All of those mean you have to look through all the menu and you're like, oh, but fried cheese sticks, why can't I have those? Instead of being given a menu that has all healthy options and you can just choose which one sounds good to you. So what we see in the food system is they are not making money off of spinach and lentils and kale and brown rice, right? That's not where they're going to make their money. They're going to make their money off packaged food. They're going to make their money off things where they put lots of sugar in it because sugar stimulates that part of the brain where you activate cravings and it gives you that dopamine hit, right? Oh, it feels good, right? I had a hard day. I want a dopamine hit of something sweet. All that to say, it makes it really hard right? The brain wants to do something different. The heart wants to do something different. And the brain says, no, that's hard. So now you know that it takes thousands of trials, right? You know about the brain. It takes thousands of trials. You know that it's better to do it in an intense amount of time. And you know that it, the brain gets tired when it has to make lots and lots of decisions. So how can you use this knowledge to help change what you're eating or your eating patterns. I was asking about this on Facebook the other day. I was like, what do you call that? I don't want to call it a diet. Diet sounds horribly restrictive. And a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm not going to just do a diet. I want to do something, you know, I can't do that. It's too hard. And, and that's not what this is, right? We're talking about a nourishment plan, a wellness plan, right? How do you take care of yourself? How do you change what you're eating to eat something that supports you? What do you do when you reach that point, when you know you want to change it? So first of all, just knowing it's going to be uncomfortable can be a huge support, just knowing that it's not supposed to be easy. So when it feels hard, you can attribute it to the brain just being like that for every single individual in the world, <laughs> right? There is actually nothing wrong with you when it's hard to change what you're eating. I know for, for myself, anytime I try to do something and it's hard, I think, oh, I must be doing it wrong right? That's this voice in the head, this little rah, 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 voice in the head. It's just hard because that's how the brain works. It wants to save energy. It wants to be able to do things it already knows how to do. It wants to save energy by doing what it's always done. And it wants to do what it knows how to do. And you are asking it to do something different. So a way to help work with this. So now you know, well, okay, it's not me. It's just the brain. What you can do, a second thing that you can do is that you can come up with that reason of why changing what you're eating is important to you. The reason you're doing this change has got to be strong enough to carry you through the challenging moments. This is your commitment, right? going to your friend's birthday party and you're surrounded by all the things that are not in your new nourishment plan, that are not part of what you want to take in and eat, and doing that without knowing why, it's probably not going to work, right? Because then you're relying on willpower. And as I've talked about before, changing what you're eating is not about willpower. You just can't. It's, willpower is not strong enough <laughs> to overcome the brain who wants to make it easy. Even just being in the house with 
a bag of M&Ms that are your kids' M&Ms in the cabinet is going to be hard when you're saying, I'm not going to eat sugar or I'm not going to eat dairy or both, right? Because it's there and you're going to get tired and you're going to get hungry and it's going to be right there and the brain is going to say, it's just so easy. Why don't you just have just one, just one M&M? And if you don't have that place to come back to of, you know what, I don't want to be tired and a low energy anymore, right? That could be a really good why. So especially when you are tired at the end of the day, remember the brain wants it to be easy. Willpower doesn't work, so come up with a reason. Is it that you want to have more energy to play with your kids? Or maybe it's to be able to go dancing with your friends or to have enough energy to apply for the new job. Or maybe they, you just want to be able to go on a 20-minute hike by yourself, right? What do you want and why do you want it? This is going to be what you're going to practice thinking. You see the M&Ms, you want the M&Ms, you notice this little voice, you could just have one. And you remind yourself, you know, I'm ready to not be tired. I'm willing to do this to not be low energy with my kids anymore. The third thing is to keep noticing, right? So this is going to be a super powerful tool. Noticing is the basis of mindfulness, right? It's just being aware without judgment. And that awareness can be super helpful because then you can notice, I really want those M&Ms. <laughs> I really want to have that birthday cake at my friend's party. And notice, all right, I'm going to remember what's my why. Why am I doing this? What's the thought I'm going to bring in, right? Notice what thoughts are present. Notice what emotions pop up when you reach for the donuts or the M&Ms or the, or, or the wine, Bring as much compassionate awareness without judgment as you can to that moment. Maybe you did have a really hard day. Maybe what you really need is a nap. Maybe what you need is some food that feels crunchy in your mouth like carrots or crackers, right? Attention can help drive the change that you want to see. And really, awareness is what's hanging out in attention. So attention is a cognitive skill, right? It's a skill that we can actually learn to increase. Mindfulness and meditation is one of the ways that we can learn to pay attention more easily and again, without judgment. Finally, you have to prepare for these moments. <laughs> you have to prepare. The brain will get tired. The brain will get fatigued. There's just like, it's going to happen. So prepare for it. The brain is going to resist. Prepare for it. It will fight against you. Prepare for it. Your job is to use your energy when you have energy, when you have brain energy. And I've read that for, you know, depending on your circadian rhythms, right, you might notice that you have more energy in the morning or you might notice that you have more energy in the middle of the day, right? Whenever you have that energy, your job is to put in that energy ahead of time, right? You've committed to what you want to do, you have your why, and you're going to do the things that are going to prepare you for when you are tired and when you are hungry and when you are going to that friend's and everyone else is eating the birthday cake from the grocery store, right? That's full of horribleness. So preparing for it, preparing for it may look like putting meditation on your calendar. It may mean making meal plans when you're not hungry, right? When you are rested on the weekend, maybe. Get rid of any of the offending food in your house. I am 2,000 times more likely to eat M&Ms if they're sitting in my counter space, right? Luckily, my kids enjoy candy <laughs> every once in a while that I don't like. 
right? And that's great because I'm like, I'm not tempted by it. Like, I don't want a Jolly Rancher. It's like, ugh. like, why would I want to eat that? But if they have something that's like, you know, every once in a while, um, we'll buy this Daya, it's vegan chocolate cheesecake. Oh my gosh, it is not low sugar, <laughs> but it is, it is delicious. And that is something that it's like, no, I just can't have that on a regular basis for me. So I want to make sure that I don't buy that at the grocery store. Or if somebody gives something to us, right? Like I'm going to cut half of it in half and give it to my neighbors or give it to somebody else. You can also go shopping, right? Have lots of quick foods that you can grab that make it easy. That's why my kids will grab, you know, whatever is easiest. And if it happens to be healthy, they'll grab it if it's easiest and it's ready for them. The same thing is true for you. Whatever fits into your new nourishment plan or wellness plan or your whatever you have set up of what you want to eat during the day, have it ready for yourself so that you aren't tempted to go out to eat. Work with someone to support you in figuring this out so you don't have to. That's going to help your brain too because your brain goes, oh, this is much easier if someone is doing it with me. So I know one of the things that I do for my clients is I help them with recipes. I help them with food ideas for what they can eat. If they're like, I don't like mushrooms, then we come up with some um, recipes that don't have mushrooms. If they are allergic to soy, we come up with recipes that don't have soy, right? We come up with all the possibilities if we're looking for foods that will support them, foods that if they know they are never going to make a really... um, elaborate meal, then we're going to come up with what is the simple way to get good nourishing food for you. This will help with consistency when you have support, when you pre-plan, when you know what's going on and why. When you are adding in new food items or removing food items, the just one bowl of ice cream doesn't really work. Because then going back to this mass practice in an intensive amount of time, you've disrupted that practice, right? With, I'm going to eat good, I'm going to eat good. And oh, when I want to, I can have a milkshake. Oh, when I want to, I can have ice cream. It not only does it disrupt the body's ability to get that offending, you know, inflammatory item out of your body, it also is giving your mind the opportunity to not stick to the nutrition plan that you've come up with, right? It's disrupted those thousands of trials and you, you're you not then building your neuronal pathway. So does that mean you should beat yourself up if you're able not able to make those changes? Of course not. If you've been following me ever, if you've listened to any other podcast, if you're new here, welcome. <laughs> but the whole idea is beating yourself up doesn't make the change that you want to see right? As I mentioned previously, it is all about compassionate awareness. If you have the milkshake, it's okay, right? It's okay. And maybe you need to revisit your why. Maybe you need to have some more support. What do you need so that you can be successful, right? It's all about that compassionate awareness because you might say, oh, look, I just ate that tub of ice cream. Okay, well, I didn't want to do that. That's not what I was expecting. It's not part of my why. And I wonder what happened, right? You can get really curious about why did I pull out the ice cream? What kind of a day did I have? What led me to that? And then thinking about how can I support myself in creating what I want to create and doing what I want to do? Okay, dear ones, I hope this is helpful as you are nourishing your body, thinking about ways that you can nourish your body, use your brain, use what the brain can do to help your body. Thank you so much for listening. Take good care of yourself. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Whole Body Upgrade. If you'd like to learn more about working with me, you can visit me on Facebook or Instagram or on my website, Centered You, that's centered, Y-O-U dot com.
see you on the next episode of Whole Body Upgrade. Thank you.